okay so 18th night is fine it's not a problem 18th midnight okay all right so in your um, so we'll start with the material for FTRM from from this class onwards so in this particular uh, in this particular pro, pro, uh, course you'll be doing a project uh, which involves trading in US equity options okay so essentially what you'll have is uh, you'll have you can see a big jump what happened to this uh, what happened to the oil price do you know you, you have some idea about that okay so according to the market talk what is that supposed to be due to Iran has hit uh, the biggest oil processing facility so you can see here if you can look at uh, yeah you can see this kind of a long term slightly uh, more data you can see the big jump over the weekend okay so this is one of some of the problems of trading in markets like if you had a short position over the weekend uh, then suddenly there's some bad news over the weekend then you would get burnt because the market would open sharply higher because of the weekend uh, gap so this is one of the risks of trading in market so if you had a stop in this situation if you had a stop order you would basically uh, get executed much I don't know exactly where it opened but if you just go by the chart okay if you just go by the chart you're looking at basically last Friday closing was around here and you can see what difference around seven dollars up the market opened okay it may not have picked up all the data but uh, it's, it's, it's clearly there is a big opening gap over the weekend so these are some of the risks you can never get rid of this risk okay this risk will always be there so that's why you have uh, limited risk initially on each position and uh, then you uh, that basically curtails your position size and hopefully you don't lose too much money if uh, on on this kind of event these kind of events don't happen every day but they do happen so uh, that's what you have to be aware of okay all right so uh, what we are going to do in this case is uh, we just had a look at that so we are going to be trading in this particular uh, 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 course will be trade you doing a similar project but this time we'll be trading in options okay and we'll be trading in US equity options okay so uh, essentially what we'll have is so you have a I think you have another uh, file in your in this right you have another file here you should look at this file these are the tickers that you're going to be using okay we we'll just forget about the volume numbers these are the equity tickers that you're going to be using okay you recognize most of these uh, so the, the difference between the what is the difference between the blue and the yellow can someone tell me anybody has has a guess we have looked at the SPY many times what is Blue chip company's value remains stable. No, no, no. Blue is not blue chip here. Blue is not. Ignore these volume numbers. These volume numbers are a little bit old. I'm just going to make them um, much, much smaller because it doesn't matter. We will continue to use these same stocks because they wouldn't have really changed much in volume. All right. So just ignore this. Okay. So you see the difference between the blue and the uh, and the and the uh, yellow is the blue ones are cyan actually these are all ETFs you know what is an ETF what, what an ETF is yes you don't know what an ETF is yeah what is it exchange traded exchange traded what exchange traded what any idea what is it likely to be what what do you ETF F for France Funds. fund okay exchange traded fund okay so ETF is exchange traded fund these are very common even in India today you have very, uh, ETFs are very common in the US they are just proliferating uh, you know every week you find some new ETF being launched so ETFs uh, we are only talking about very very mainline ETFs so an ETF essentially is just nothing but a basket of stocks it's an exchange traded fund so it's a basket of stocks where the selection of the basket is essentially defined in a particular way so the first thing we are learning today let's uh, diarize all this stuff okay in your uh, <coughs> book actually this should come further down we'll take it down later um, because we need to talk about these decision problems and uh, how they are modified by the introduction of options because when we 
uh, when we had looked at these decision problems in the past, we had not considered options. We had just considered simple spot instruments. Okay, so we'll deal with that later. So the first thing we are learning today is about your new project. And so you have an ETF, which is, you already know, I'm not going to write this because you can get this on Google. So an ETF is an exchange traded fund, essentially. So um, um, let's say, um, where you have objective rules for selecting so this is in your notes this file will remain in your drive in your folder so you will have access to this so you have objective rules for selecting stocks i'm not going to write perfect english so we're going to write within the fund essentially so an etf like for instance you guys would have heard of this bank nifty okay so that is essentially like an exchange traded fund okay essentially what it has is it has some fairly predefined when you look at the prospectus for that etf you will find a bank nifty is actually an index and there will be an etf based on that index okay which tries to replicate the performance of the index so the bank nifty would have a bunch of banks in there they might have some kind of cutoffs like if your market cap is below this then we don't include you right but there'll be so the bank nifty is not going to have companies like uh, hindustan lever and itc in it because they're not banks okay so, so essentially when you have anything like that okay that's a etf essentially it's a it's just a basket of stocks so the way to think about an etf is just a basket of stocks okay so etf a basket of stocks and the basket is basically being called a fund okay so one thing the etf is surely not is it's not one stock that's why i've made a distinction between is this your project no that's why I made a distinction between what is this? What company is this? Oracle. Okay, so Oracle is a single company. It's a single tick. I mean, it's a single ticker, single common stock of Oracle. Okay, but if you look at a, 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 a an ETF like QQQ, okay, this cube, this is a, and, uh, this this replicates the Nasdaq 100 index. Okay, so in that basically this just like you have a bank nifty index like a sub index. Okay, so you can create an ETF to mimic that index. Similarly, this QQQ mimics the uh, one of the famous indices in the US is the NASDAQ 100 index. Okay, which is just nothing but the top 100 stocks in the on the NASDAQ. Okay, listed on the NASDAQ. Just like the SPY mimics the S&P 500, which is the index of five top 500 stocks by market cap. Okay, so these are all based on these are all famous ETF tickers and they are based on these are mimicking certain indices. Okay, so because it's mimicking an index, it must have all the stocks or at least most of the stocks in the index. Okay, so this becomes a portfolio of stocks or a basket of stocks. Just like when you have a fund in a fund, you have a portfolio of stocks, right? So therefore, that's why it's called an exchange traded fund. Okay, the reason it's an exchange traded fund and not a kind of an offline mutual fund is because it's got some fairly uh, you know well defined rules that's why i was writing it this way that okay let me just put a qualifier fairly objective some of it may not be 100 percent objective but uh, you know say for instance in the bank nifty etf i might say i will include banks which have a market cap of more than 1000 crores or something like that okay i'll put in some characteristics then i'll say they must have a minimum volume traded of so many shares per day by putting in but these are fairly objective criteria okay and these will be included in this particular etf so any bank which meets the uh, these requirements will be in the etf so unlike a normal fund where if you're looking at the hdfc uh, growth fund or something like that you can't really predict the composition of the fund because it depends on what the fund manager wants you know if he's very bullish on a particular stock he'll go into that stock and he may not have other stocks in his portfolio right so he can be a very concentrated portfolio itself so you can't predict the composition of a, a typical actively managed fund okay like the hdfc growth fund or something like that these are actively managed funds we call them actively managed funds so these are not the composition of the the, the main point about these funds is uh, the composition of the fund is not predictable at any point of time because it depends on what the portfolio manager is bullish on at that point of time right so he may sell something he may buy something else so you can't really predict but in the case of an etf essentially the composition is fairly predictable 
because by the nature of the name of the ETF, you can figure out that obviously in the Bank Nifty ETF, you will not find in the Sunlever and ITC, okay, and Airtel and all these companies because they are not banks, okay. So you can basically, so that's what I mean that by ETF, essentially it's a fairly standardized kind of uh, set of rules for selecting stocks, but it's essentially a basket of stocks, okay. So the reason I've given you because obviously because it's a basket of stocks, so uh, which in general a basket of stocks is likely to be less volatile than the individual stock or more volatile? Less volatile. Remember you talk? Yeah. Less volatile. Remember you did diversification in your uh, when you did your Markowitz efficient frontier and all these things, right? So you did diversification. So generally there is a, a diversification effect because all the stocks don't move together. So then really a portfolio tends to be a little bit less volatile than the um, uh, than the ETF. But these ETFs are very actively traded. So this is on the S&P 500 index, the SPY. This QQQ is on the, the, uh, is on the NASDAQ 100 index. The XLF is the, uh, you can just Google all this on, uh, you can just query this, go to Yahoo Finance and, uh, you know, query these stickers, you can learn a little bit about them. This is a financial sector ETF, okay, so it has financial stocks in it and GDX is essentially for gold miners. So this particular GDX, this ETF, when you're buying this ETF, it's like you're buying a whole portfolio of gold mining stocks. Okay, so the top gold mining stocks, some of them do other types of mining also like copper, silver, but essentially these are mining stocks. Okay, so uh, these are the ETFs that you have. These are actively traded. So I put them there and then there's also an element of sectoral diversification because I wanted to expose you to different sectors. Okay, and then all these are, these are also sectorally diversified. You see some are from technology, some are from consumer products, some are for uh, social media. All right, that I think is a that's a that that's not really connected to Facebook. So these are social media, these are e-commerce. Okay, this is Ford Motor. This is MU is Micron Technology. This is US Steel. Then you have Netflix, General Electric, Comcast, etc. All these stocks. So these are all main mainline actively traded stocks in the US. You have a nice sector diversification. So this is going to be your universe of markets. Okay, and you'll be trading options on these stocks. So you're not allowed to, as a part of the as the condition of the project, you'll be trading only options on these stocks. You can't trade. You're not allowed to trade the underlying stocks so we'll get all this stuff here but this will give you exposure this is a very limited type of option trading but this is the first exposure to option trading so I'm going to put some limitations on what you can trade let's see if we launch option trader on Microsoft by the way there was a, a bit of wrong information in one of the presenters I don't know if you were there for the uh, conclave so one of the presenters presented G, uh, GM as a company which no longer exists so that actually is not correct okay because GM went into bankruptcy but GM emerged from bankruptcy GM is a very much uh, alive and kicking the company is very much alive and kicking it's kicking more in China than in the US because they make more uh, stuff in China but GM is it's not correct to say that GM no longer exists because they went into bankruptcy then they emerged from bankruptcy okay so on, under US bankruptcy law even under US, uh, our, our law also you can emerge for our new IBC you can still emerge from bankruptcy no, notice what I'm doing I'm going to Microsoft okay right click looking at trading tools looking at option trader let's see how much data we gave because uh, how much data we get because actually now the market is closed the market is closed right now so we may get some old data Yes. What happened? Market. Because New York is 9:15 in New York. It has to open. It has to open. It will open at 9:15 in New York. Okay. So we have. Uh, okay. Thank <laughs> you.
All right, so you will get this kind of a setup, okay? Uh, so this is what you have, and now everything is grayed out. Everything is grayed out because the market is closed. Okay, so the options markets are also closed. The underlying market is also closed. If you want to see something which is trading right now, I'm sure we'll see a lot of activity. Let's look at crude oil, October 19. We still have a little bit of uh, time for that. Let's look at that. Let's look at option trader and crude oil. You'll see, hopefully you'll see live prices here, okay? All right, so this is what you're going to have to do. So everyone's getting the scheme of it. Uh, you're getting the, no, I'm going to send you some invites. I'm going to send you some invites through uh, the, through the T, my own TWS login. So you will get a set of invitations uh, in your email uh, asking you to open an account. So please follow the instructions. And in this case, you will have to uh, set up, uh, you'll have to define your own password and ID. Okay, you will be defining it yourself. Okay, so please make sure that you don't forget it. As soon as you define it, share it with your group members so that in case you forget it or misplace it, the other guys have it. Okay, I'll be giving you, I'm going to send out now. You can see here, this is trading actually. I think we can close this also and we can see a little bit more. All right, can you see? I think this is trading. Can you see that? Bid ask is. This is moving around bid ask is moving around you can see that okay because this market and especially now because of this news that has come up this market will be quite active we don't have too many days we're not going to look at this one let's look at the one which has one month to expiration one day to expiration is not much fun in that okay you'll see here also the prices are moving so this here the market is moving because these are these are actually options based on futures these are futures options okay these are called futures options so we'll go through the different types of options but the point is basically that these are um, the underlying in this case is the futures contract the futures contract is trading and you can see all this green and red and all that stuff which means basically it's a down take up take so this stuff is trading actively and because of this movement uh, recent news and the price movement uh, this market is active right now okay so this is based on the underlying which is the uh, the crude oil contract okay this is the west texas intermediate crude oil contract okay all right so uh, let's go back to this so you will get when you get your uh, when you get your ids okay i'll again send you the invite set up the ids i'm going to send i'm going to send invites to everybody so we have about 34 people in the in the group so you'll get uh, everybody in the group will get an id now remember two things because we are going to use the same id and login same set of ids and logins we are going to use for ifm also we're going to have a different project in ifm but we are going to use the same uh, tws now think in terms of tws logins the old nse like vaishali and all had requested keep it there keeping it live okay but you have to keep logging into it okay if you don't log in for maybe 15 days or 30 days they they'll uh, disable the account so every 15 20 days make sure you log into it so that you keep it live you don't have to do anything just log in and log out okay so that set of ids that's a different set of tws ids those are nse ids okay those are separate now you will create a new set of nse i uh, you'll create a new set of tws ids when you get the email from me okay so that is going to carry us through the FTRM project as well as the subsequent project in IFM. Okay. So if you get about five, uh, five uh, IDs per group. Okay. So I think you'll have about five IDs per group. Every group has five members at least. Okay. So at least five IDs per group. Keep away two IDs. One for live, one for live trading in FDRM, and one for live trading in IFM. Are you clear? Minimum of five IDs. So two IDs you straight away keep away. Okay, you will do some data entry in that, set up the tickers, and then you keep the other three clearly as practice accounts. This is clear? Clear demarcation. There should be no trading in the uh, project trading account. So identify the two project trading accounts at the beginning itself, keep them away, okay, and then trade and practice in the practice accounts. This is clear? Okay, but what you should do in every account, even in the uh, ones which you have identified for project trading even in those accounts you should go there and set up all these tickers okay if i insert all right so i want to set up you're going to repeat this exercise what do i need i have microsoft and oracle i need i've got fb as well i need pg i need f so i do here i go here i enter pg pg is what 
Procter and Gamble. Okay. So PG. Now, obviously, you, when you say PG, this guy gives you lots of options. The system. You don't want Premier Gold Mines. Okay. You want basically the smart stock here. The Procter and Gamble on the NYSE. The stock, smart shop stock. Okay. Is this clear? You enter this. Okay. So everything is obviously closed. The next one is F. F is what? Ford Motor, right? F is Ford Motor. Again, you choose Smart Stock, and then I'll just add one more stock for your. Uh, we'll just add Amazon. The moment you enter the ticker, and you uh, you can see here, this is listed on the Nasdaq. So when you're talking about the Nasdaq 100 index, Amazon will be one of those companies in that Nasdaq 100 index. Okay. All right, so you can see all this stuff. Obviously, after 9:15, when Bharat wakes up, he will see that the these markets come alive. 9:15 in the in, in uh, U.S. time, okay, around I think eight o'clock or seven o'clock our, our time, okay. So uh, then you'll see that now, right now, everything is on C because the market is closed. Uh, but at 9:15, uh, this market, you'll see all these prices will have live bid ask changing constantly, okay. All right. Are you getting the scheme of things here? Okay. So you don't need to clutter it with all this stuff. So what you should what you should do once you get your login IDs and log into all the accounts. Be careful about the project trading accounts. Don't do any trading. But set up the tickers. Set up the tickers in those at least some of the tickers in those accounts. Okay. And keep track of this. And already you should start with. I hope everybody by now has a login here on this trading view. And also go to Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance, you'll get long-term data, okay, on U.S. stocks. Uh, you'll get long-term data, and then uh, you can combine that with this because here you'll get very good intraday charts, okay. So if you look at, right, so you can see good intraday charts here, okay, which you will not get on Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is good for long-term data, but it's kind of interday data actually. They're not very good. They have only five days of intraday charts. Um, so this this gives you much wider uh, much wider choice of intraday charts. So you combine these two, and you should already start now that you know the markets that you're going to be trading. You should already start making yourself familiar with the movement in these prices. Like what should I do on Amazon? Straight away, forming start forming views. Like everything I told you, everything in finance is about taking views on markets. Okay, so start forming views on markets on Amazon. Like if you look at a long-term chart here, now you you have a decision to take. Do you think that this is going to go higher and make new highs? So far, looks like a strong uptrend, right? Okay, because Tarun has just placed lots of orders on Amazon, so this is going up. So then you want to buy. Then you have to decide where you want to put your stop. Okay, but the only difference is start forming your views on the underlying. But remember, in the project, making start making yourself familiar with the underlying price movement. Okay, but remember, in the project, you are not going to be allowed to buy or sell the underlying. You will have to buy or sell options on the underlying. Okay, so we are coming to that. But get familiar with the underlying because that's a big part of forming your views. There's another element to it which we'll come to. But this is a big part of forming the views. Is this clear? So start getting familiar. You have a lot of markets to cover. And if you miss any opportunity, maybe there's an opportunity in U.S. Steel. Okay. If you miss that, maybe there's a maybe that's the only one which has a strong trend. I think this is U.S. Steel. Yeah. U.S. Steel is very famous because even many years ago, I remember reading uh, the CEO of U.S. Steel. He doesn't have a secretary. He used to pick up his own phone calls and arrange his own. So it was a famously lean company. So here you can see what is happening in U.S. Steel. So there's maybe there's an opportunity here as well. So you should track all the markets that you're allowed to trade in because you never know where the opportunity is, right? So that's what you should get familiar with all this. Start setting up your tickers in the TWS logins, okay? And uh, this is how we are going to proceed. So now we'll start. Now that you know what has to be done, is everyone clear what has to be done? You will wait for the email invites from me. Set up your own ID and password. Do not lose them, okay? Then it cannot be recovered if you lose them. So you be better make sure you have procedures to make sure that you can retrieve the the stuff. Share it with your teammates and no with nobody else, okay? Uh, Okay, so the next point. So this is what you have to do. This this file is also in your folder, so there's no problem. Now we are going to get into uh, right. Okay, 
So we learned that an ETF is a basket of stocks. Uh, let me make it even more clear and make it individual. So we distinguish between is a basket of uh, individual common stocks, okay, using the US uh, balance, individual common stocks, a basket or a portfolio, okay. So basically straight away what you know is in an ETF what you do not have is just one stock. It's always going to have at least two stocks, okay, and usually it'll have many. And if you go into the if you go into uh, if you go into Yahoo Finance and uh, query on any of these ETFs, if you see the there'll be an option to see the holdings. So you can go to XLF or GDX and see the holdings. Uh, you'll see what are the top ten holdings of XLF. Obviously, one of the big ones will be JP Morgan, then Citibank, Citicorp, and all these things. You can see the top ten holdings of that fund it's like a fund so obviously so you can see the top 10 holdings of that you'll see it on yahoo finance okay so basically this is the portfolio whereas these are individual stocks all right okay so we move on to our so what we are going to do is now we'll start our introductory discussion on options okay so so how should we define options let's just get into our introductory so so all this stuff i'm writing down this is all in your notes this note is in your folder now this is not I, this is not IPM. Yeah, this note is in your folder. All right. Okay. So options. Okay. As we know, first of all, options are an instrument or an asset class. Options are an instrument. In some textbooks, you'll find options are being referred to as an asset class, but that's not actually a good classification you'll find in fact in your first textbook that i gave you by the way many of you have not collected your textbooks there was a complaint many of you have not collected your textbooks others i saw your name there collected ipm textbook okay collected these books are not useless there's parts of the book which are useful we have not yet come to the parts where i would refer you to the book for certain material okay but it's not a waste of time uh, it's not a waste uh, of uh, space okay so carry the books with you some fundamental analysis and all can be done from there uh, so uh, but in that book you'll find and many other books you'll find this terminology uh, markets they have divided divided into uh, stocks bonds options and futures okay this is not a good classification because first of all it's not complete okay what have they left out they have left out in instruments they have left out swaps they have left out forwards all these instruments are left out if you're only talking about options and futures you have left out spot instruments okay these are all different types of contracts instruments are essentially like different types of financial market contracts these are different because they are different types of contracts they have different features okay and then on asset classes if you say stocks bonds of uh, uh, options and futures okay which is a common classification of markets the problem other problem with that is where is the where are the currencies where are the commodities all that is left out from that classification okay so that's why i have proposed this as a better classification because it's more comprehensive it covers everything it covers even real estate as an asset class and if anybody ever asks you i don't think i had this discussion with you guys that you can see this it's already in the framework this framework is already shared with you that if anyone ever asked you why have you not see many people talk about credit they talk about credit as a asset class okay so why is credit not in, in my framework why is credit not a separate asset class because are you following the logic part of debt have I discussed this with you okay so I should tell you this because people might ask you okay if you say that major asset classes are equities debt commodities currencies and real estate they'll say what about credit many people consider credit as a separate asset class so credit because there's a big uh, universe of credit derivatives you've heard of credit default swaps have you heard of credit default so you should have heard of them but uh, there is a, there's a big market for credit derivatives okay uh, that is one of the sectors that got hit during the financial crisis but there's still a big market for credit derivatives okay so credit derivatives you have to understand one thing about you remember this term credit derivatives okay we're talking about this now so one of the things you have to understand about credit derivatives is 
in or remember that all derivatives like is this font too small can you guys see tanya can you see on the last bench you can still read this okay so you can see here that when we are talking about derivative markets i'm contrasting it with what underlying, underlying markets okay and these are also sometimes as i've said here sometimes also called cash markets okay so, so sometimes i might say derivative markets versus cash markets or sometimes i might say derivative markets versus underlying markets okay so this is why i say that finance is much more like law than like finance like than like physics because everything is contextual now when i'm saying derivative markets versus cash markets here if i'm using that kind of contrast this cash market is not the same as this value cash okay so i'm using the same word but you have to understand from the context that it doesn't have the same meaning it, this will never happen in physics in physics we have a term it will always mean the same thing in every wherever you go okay so this you have to understand are you following what i'm saying here yes sir that when i say derivative markets and cash markets that cash in that statement is not the same thing as value cash like i want to buy cash dollars i want to buy dollars value cash these are not the same cash these two is the statement the word cash in these two statements is not the same okay so when cash markets are used along with derivative markets okay in contrast contrast to derivative markets they have the same meaning as underlying markets okay so when we are talking about options on uh, which we saw didn't work out well okay that because microsoft is closed now these are options on crude oil okay so here you would even say cash markets usually we use it for the for the equity market uh, or the debt market the uh, spot markets in equities and debt but if you had set up uh, options for let's say if you have set up options for microsoft okay you would refer to this which is the underlying common stock the underlying common stock for microsoft you would refer to that as the cash market and you would refer to the options on microsoft as the derivative market this is clear are you following no what is not clear okay let me go through the let, let me let me go through the definition of options and left definition of derivatives first then it will become clearer okay you guys are familiar with the definition of derivatives no not familiar with derivatives okay so we can just copy this into your notes to make your so first let's get this clear now this is too small actually um, i made it even smaller okay so before i lose my uh, the small view on cred uh, the uh, you know the the highly zoomed in uh, view or zoomed out view actually so credit if somebody asks you let me finish that point then we'll get to it so if somebody asks you why is credit not an asset class in your framework what you have to say is credit is subsumed within debt because the main thing i'll show you later on that if you you cannot have a credit derivative without an underlying lending borrowing transaction okay when uh, ritesh takes a housing loan from pnb there is a lending borrowing happening okay so there this is a form of credit giving extending credit the bank is extending credit okay so that's why we have the term credit by credit derivative okay so when we work is issuing bonds okay uh, to help it you know tide over the problem with its uh, ipo delayed ipo so here also there is a lending borrowing transaction because we work is borrowing money by issuing bonds and the investors are lending money to we work okay by buying the bonds okay so the point is and this is a credit this is a form of credit extension okay so the point is that you cannot have a credit derivative without an underlying lending borrowing transaction so for every credit derivative that it exists there must be a underlying credit uh, underlying somebody somewhere must have borrowed money or lent money or there will be some kind of bond index which is again made up of bonds okay so if you drill down through the index sometimes the underlying for a credit derivative might be a bond index but if you drill down through the index you will find a bunch of a bond index has to have a bunch of bonds just like a stock index has to have if you sort of smash the nifty 50 and try to see what's inside it you will see bunch of 50 common stocks 
right? The Nifty 50 almost doesn't have its own independent, it's just composed of 50 common stocks, right? So similarly, if you smash through the bond index, you'll find a bunch of bonds inside. So therefore, at the end of the day, you come to a bunch of bonds, which is basically nothing but some lending borrowing transaction. You can't have a bond without a lending borrowing transaction. Because the bond has been issued means there is a lending borrowing transaction going on that, that, that has already happened. So that's why credit has been subsumed within debt. When we talk about debt and rates as an asset class, we conceive of credit as being within this asset class. That's why we don't have a separate category for uh, credit as an asset class. Is this clear? Are you following the logic? Okay. Yes. So it's like saying, uh, why don't you include, okay, if we have, say, students of different colleges in Delhi, okay, or we ha and we say we have a category for VIP students, and then somebody says, why haven't you included DSB students as a separate category? So we say, no, we don't include DSB students as a separate category because they are included within VIP students. That is students studying within the VIPs campus. Are you following? This is the same kind of logic. Why don't you have credit as a separate category? Because credit has, we have conceptually included it under debt because you cannot have a credit derivative without an underlying uh, lending borrowing transaction, which is basically debt. The moment you have lender, lending borrowing, you have debt. Whether it's a housing loan or whether it's a company issuing a bond or it's a bank loan, the working capital finance, or bank uh, companies are taking from banks. Everything is basically debt, right? When, at the end of the day, when you put it on the balance sheet, it's, a, it's debt. It's not equity, it's debt, right? Are you following the logic? Okay, so this is exactly the reasoning for, uh, so when you're talking about this framework, why is credit not a separate asset class? Because it's included in debt, okay? Because you can't have a credit derivative without some kind of a debt transaction somewhere below, okay? All right, so now we are just coming to the concept of, so first we should understand derivatives properly before we come to options. Okay, so first thing we learned is ETF. Next thing we learn is derivatives, okay? What is a derivative instrument? Okay, so sometimes you may, f you may find, uh, you know, the uh, definition of a derivative if you look at your books, okay? Have you got your new uh, Hull and White, Hull and ba ba Hull Basu textbook? Yes. Okay, now let me tell you something else about these uh, Indian textbooks that you have these, um, yeah these Indian textbooks that you have what you have to do is you'll notice that in this uh, set of courses the three finance electives uh, we have a lot of material to cover and I won't be able to cover everything I want to cover because we just don't have the time okay and we want to make sure there's no pressure to cover any amount of material we have to make sure that you understand what is being covered okay like Kushbu has uh, an issue with some of the definitions so we'll come back and address that so you have to it's very important that you ask questions and if you are not satisfied you should keep on asking the question so it's important that whatever we cover at least everybody should be clear there's no point you know smartly nodding your head uh, you know that I have understood when you have actually not understood right so I like I remember once in in lab Amisha was very not happily nodding her head I have understood but from the facial expression you can see that she has not understood but she's under peer pressure or something she's nodding saying that I have understood so I'm not just her but it happens with many people so we don't want to have that happening if you don't understand you should just say that you don't understand there's no shame in that okay we make sure we cover so what's going to happen is basically the as far as the uh, these books are concerned the textbooks okay so you need to understand the theory of uh, finance all the stuff that we are covering in the courses but you also have to have some familiarity with indian markets okay you need to know what's going on in india what kind of markets exist in india okay so for that obviously you should be watching your local cnbc tv 18 and all that stuff so you'll get watch the market roundup okay i've told you to watch that as well and then what you do is you go through these textbooks carefully even the first ipm textbook okay uh, and see wherever there's a section on indian markets there'll be a section uh, maybe after some of the chapters there's a section on indian markets you make sure you read that and you understand what is traded in india what is available like one of your super seniors i remember one day he said in class that there are no there are no commodity derivatives in india which is not correct so mcx sx tech, trades commodity derivatives okay so you should have you shouldn't have these kind of knowledge gaps so you should also know what's going on in india and for that 
your responsibility is for all these three textbooks that you'll get you'll get another textbook in IFM okay so for all these three textbooks, I'm not going to repeat this instruction later uh, again okay as uh, you go through these books find out where are their sections on Indian markets okay and you go through those sections and you make sure you uh, understand what's going on in India and if there are certain terms that you don't understand then you can uh, raise those questions in the class and I'll explain them mostly those sections are not conceptual they are just giving you information on what is there in India in the Indian market but at least you should have that information okay you should know like you should not be saying there are no commodity derivatives in India okay so you you should have that uh, fill, uh, part filled out on your own okay so this you have to do on your own I don't have time to tell you in India we have these markets okay we can't afford to waste class time on that so as far as derivative uh, the uh, now this is our here okay in your notes we are talking about okay so typically if you look at so well, let's start from the basics okay uh, have you heard you haven't heard any derivative uh, any definition of derivatives okay all right so let's uh, try and save time and uh, uh, so instead of asking around I'll just tell you the definition myself okay so what this is your definition of the derivative product okay just try to understand it it's in your notes so you don't have to note this down now you notice I put this little intra alia here okay so Or actually this entire area is a little uh, redundant because if I've said principally that's already a hedge okay but I've just put it in uh, to be extra sure okay normally what you find in, in the uh, textbook definitions of derivatives is a derivative is an instrument whose value is derived from uh, from an underlying asset okay from an underlying asset or some other uh, so from uh, another asset which is referred to as the underlying asset now this definition is actually slightly problematic because if you look at uh, your um, when we look at uh, when we look at option pricing models and stuff like that you'll see that uh, it's not just one underlying asset which is determining the value of that because see we have to be very particular about language people are normally not particular about language if I just read this if I block out this part if I block out this inter alia and principally then you read this is what you find in most of the textbooks that a derivative is an instrument whose value is derived from an, from an underlying asset okay so when you read it in this when you write the definition in this manner does it not have the sense of only from the value of an underlying asset because I have not put a quality so the value is derived from the value of an underlying asset so this this has the suggestion that it is derived only from the value of the underlying asset are you following what I'm saying why are we so careful about the use of words that's why I put in two hedges because it's not derived only from the value of the underlying asset there are other inputs also which go into it okay are you following what I'm getting at okay so you have something you have the derivative product whose value is derived principally from the value of an underlying asset so the moment I put in the word principally there's already a hedge I have already covered myself because if somebody says oh you said it is derived principally from but it is there are many other factors then I will counter by saying that that's why I said principally if it says principally that means it automatically has the idea that there are other factors also but the value of the underlying asset is the principal driver are you following how language is used yes everybody is on board okay so that's why I'm adding these modifications actually principally alone would cover it as a hedge okay because the moment somebody says to you that there are other factors also you can say that's why I said principally okay I didn't say it is covered on it is derived only from okay but it to be extra you know uh, you know uh, as a, uh, you know by way of abundant caution I've added inter alia you remember inter alia forgot an inter alia from law from your law course very important to two very important words in your business communication okay. yes nobody remembers inter alia it's shocking I, I'm sure I told you this in lab I must have used it in yes nobody remembers Ganotra you don't remember okay inter alia means among others among other things or among others okay so very important two words to remember Remember, whenever you are, whenever there is an opportunity to squeeze in these two words, you squeeze them in. Okay, 
so if somebody asks you, i think i gave you this example somebody asks you what do you need to complete this to hold the hr conclave you say to conduct the hr conclave you say i need inter alia i need abc that later on when you discover that uh, you need def also you can squeeze it in because you said at the beginning you said inter alia you didn't just say i need abc because if you say i need abc that means you need only abc then later on when you come to me i want def i said why well, you never told me that before are you following what i'm saying inter alia two very important words whenever you are using your, whenever you are writing if there is an opportunity to squeeze in inter alia you squeeze it in it is a hedge it basically covers you for the future yes are you following so therefore value is derived inter alia actually principally is not required if i if i write this that's good enough actually okay it's a uh, you know it's a superfluous actually value is derived inter alia from the value of an underlying asset okay or you can use principally as well we are coming to that okay so we'll we'll see we'll just give you a brief, brief idea basic idea about this you can see straight away here how do i close this these are actually ads i want to get rid of these anyway let's just ignore them okay so here okay now here look at this option pricing model you can see the underlying price okay this is giving you the price of the call option and the put option okay if this is the underlying price so if you change the underlying to 50 you'll see um, hopefully this works sometime i remember this was blocked earlier by our uh, server okay because this is too um, yeah because this uh, there was too low actually okay so i've changed the call and put option values by changing the underlying price okay so if i can change other things like if i change the volatility to 76 okay you'll see the call option and the put option values will change they have changed okay so it's not just the underlying which is affecting the value of the option are you getting it now yes. these are some of the factors okay so you will have this i can put this link also in your in your in your set of notes so you don't have to remember it in your notes okay so we are discussing derivatives so we can put this here one minute yes which is already now in your file yeah so all all of them will take the potential all of them will affect all of them will affect okay these are all going to affect the uh, the price okay um okay so are you following basically we'll get into the details of all this later but now the first basics derivative uh, definition of a derivative we are entering the world of derivatives so the definition we have to start from first principles since you guys are not familiar with derivative definition also but let's be clear about that so the standard once again we are standing we are studying many things from a non standard perspective because many people will say options futures stocks and bonds but i'm giving you a different classification of markets i'm giving you a different classification and i'm telling you why i'm using this classification why am i not using credit as a asset class okay that i've explained to you similarly when we had, uh, when most uh, most uh, textbooks would define derivatives as uh, instrument whose value is derived from an underlying asset that's not uh, uh, you can have a better definition you should hedge yourself that's strictly speaking not correct because it means that it's only from the underlying asset so that's why you put in the hedge value is derived inter alia okay or principally from the value of an underlying asset now you have covered yourself because now you can say that okay it doesn't matter if other factors also influence the value okay so there therein you have the uh, point of the derivative products and underlying pro, uh, underlying markets and derivative markets okay now you see why i said this here now you see why uh, our basic a uh, basic clarification uh, basic classification one of the one of the distinctions we have okay like boys and girls we have underlying markets and derivative markets okay clear okay so why did i say this and always remember you can also say cash markets and derivative markets has the same meaning okay okay 
so now uh, let's look at so we've defined this okay now let's define so let's let's be clear about one more thing here okay although we've called this now this framework is strictly speaking uh, not perfect because i need to do some uh, you know ideally i would like to do some you know various grades of colored shading etc to indicate this but here's the problem okay what kind of uh, so in, in a derivative an option is a type of derivative okay so you can see that option is listed under derivatives you can see that so option is a derivative instrument okay but now there are some uh, some qualifications we need to provide uh, to this framework because this framework seems to suggest a cut and dried demarcation right the way i have put it here cash and spot are underlying instruments and futures forward swaps and options are derivative instruments okay and because just like we say all classification the categories or the taxa should be mutually exclusive okay so therefore ordinarily we would assume that derivative markets like so therefore futures forward swaps and options can't be underlying markets and cash and spot can't be derivative markets right the strict interpretation okay are you following what i'm saying yes sir okay but actually that is not true okay at least one side of that is not true that we have to be aware that basically the underlying asset we go back to your your notes so you know what is there in your notes this is already there in your notes okay um let's try and make this a little bigger so that so the zoom is very low all right okay so now you have to be aware now we are getting our introductory uh, look at options okay so we have defined options are a derivative product so we first come up with the definition of derivatives okay the next thing is basically we have to understand uh, because whenever you have derivatives you have an underlying asset okay so now we need to understand something else that there's some uh, imperfection in this framework which we can't show because of the coloring limitations or of excel and on, of of the spreadsheet that actually you have to understand that uh, this point here what instruments can be the underlying assets for options okay it can be spot it can be all actually okay so this is where you see that there is a exception that we have to make to this framework it's not cut and dried okay what we said we said that therefore because of this framework futures forward swaps and options can never be underlying instruments underlying assets so that's not actually true okay so if you are looking at this for instance as i told you these are futures options because here when you have an option trader when you have this option trader display on tws okay the uh, underlying instrument is actually the cl october 19th futures contract cl is west texas intermediate crude oil okay that's a ticker okay you can see uh, crude oil october 19th futures contract so actually that's why i said these are futures options okay these are futures options so you can see here therefore what we are saying essentially is that you can actually have options on futures you can have uh, options on forwards you can have options on swaps and actually you can even have options on options okay those are called those are not very common options and options are not very common but they these are they, these are called compound options okay so you can read all this if you see that in your finance reference i've given you one of the books i've given you this the uh, the stand chart risk management solutions book book which is there in your finance reference okay you if you see that book there it has a discussion of all the exotic options various types of exotic options okay so you can read that book um so it's a very old book which i wrote in 1993 but it's still valid because none of the structures have changed okay so all for, it covers exchange rate uh, solutions and uh, interest rate products exchange rate products and interest rate products but you'll see all the option structures you can read about compound options in that book if you want to but the main thing to understand here is in our introductory coverage of options is that you can actually have options on uh futures on forwards on swaps and on options okay options and options are called compound options and here you see a live example of futures options that is options on an underlying where the underlying is a futures contract you can see that live here which is your west texas intermediate crude oil options these are futures options okay is this clear okay 
so this is something else you've learned now so this framework strictly speaking this particular classification needs to be qualified which we have now qualified we have made made it clear to you that these can be uh, but these can never be derivatives okay so only one side of that uh, black and white implication is not correct so cash and spot can never be derivatives okay but futures forward swaps and options can be underlying okay all right so this is the second thing we learn here all right okay instruments which form the underlying assets for options this is what we have learned here basically all right okay now options anybody wants to define options how do you define an option yes rajan very good option is a type of contract okay uh, we can even make it uh, more uh, clear and make it uh, financial market contract but actually option is a type of fin market contract that's very important important to understand that option is a type of contract then uh, in which a trader has the right but not the obligation to which trader i mean if it's a trade or a transaction there will be a buyer and a seller a transaction in a future so there is a contract okay now typically if you see for instance if you see the position that i have in 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 crude oil so i did a transaction where what is it i'm long or short so this i have a long position okay so then this so that means the futures contract is also a type of contract futures all the financial all the instruments we have listed are different types of contracts so this is the futures futures is also type of contract now in this contract what i did here is i am a buyer of the contract so there was a seller also of the contract okay now when you are talking about this so and, and as we said every uh, every uh, transaction is a, a contract to exchange assets so in this case you are talking what the buyer or the seller of the contract either of them like again either of them yeah. so either of them has the you are saying what are you saying like right you said right in which uh, either the buyer um, means buyers or seller has the right but not the obligation to sell or buy the underlying asset at a specified okay but right but not obligation to sell or buy sell or underlying asset at a specified good very good definition you've got most of it right good you remember so you did this stuff in fm1 yes sir. okay to buy underlying asset at specified time okay all right okay so we just want to uh, there's one problem is there any major problem here sir so only the buyer has the right and yeah so that's an important qualification we need to that's an important amendment only the buyer has the right buyer has right but not obligation this part that you mentioned right but not obligation this is vested in the buyer only not in the seller okay seller has a obligation okay so basically it's a type of where the buyer pays so we should maybe make it little bit um pays um i will just keep using opt so option price is referred to as premium you should be able to make a, a connection to your insurance premium when you are buying car insurance the car insurance is also an option essentially all kinds of insurance that you buy are all options life insurance car insurance medical insurance all these are also options in the in a it's in substance they are the in the same they are options in the same way that these uh, crude oil futures options or the microsoft options that you looked at okay they are fairly similar there are some other small modifications to the contract but the nature of the the nature of the obligations and the buyer seller relationship is the same so when you buy car insurance you pay a premium for car insurance health insurance life insurance premium same thing okay so this is also called so the option price this is called a premium here what is the where is the option price here for calls these are our volumes okay we don't worry 
which I think is open interest. Yeah. So these are the sensitivities. So which is our option price for the 57 strike? How much? If I want to buy the call, the November, October, October, November call for the 57 strike, what price do I have to pay? What price do I have to pay? What is the option premium? It's given here 4.44 bid ask. So if I'm buying the option, this is the bid ask of the option. Okay. So you can see the underlying is 59.68, 59.69, but actually the bid ask is for the option price is much less. Okay. So this is actually slightly in the money call. So here you have uh, the prices for 440. So if I'm buying, I will have to buy at 441. This is clear. So this is basically when you're talking about option premium, this is your option premium. This is clear. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand your I didn't understand your question. I didn't understand your question. What is the question again? No, no, I, uh, for buying the call option, then after that? No, because I was talking about calls. These are puts here. I was talking about calls. That's why I was showing it here, right? Okay. All right. Okay. So, are you following? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is what option premium means. This is the price that you have to pay for the option. Okay. All right. So that's we are going through that. So buyer pays option from a price price or premium. So essentially the exchange that is happening is that the buyer is paying the option price or the premium. Okay. And the seller in return for that option price or premium is giving the buy is giving the buyer the right without the obligation to buy the underlying asset to buy or sell the underlying asset at a specified time. Is this clear now? This specified time will also have to be changed. Buyer has the right, okay. Buyer has the right, okay, and uh, pays option price to seller. Seller is, here we write, seller is obliged to honor um, Okay, so basically, um, so we say seller has um, <coughs> okay, is this clear? The seller has the liability corresponding to the buyer's right because in law we talk about rights and liabilities in contracts in every aspect of the law we say rights and liabilities okay so we say the buyer has the right okay but not the obligation so the seller has the liability corresponding to the buyer's right so between the buyer wants to exercise his rights the seller has to agree basically has to deliver okay is everyone clear so this at This should be at or up to and this time should actually be times we'll see later on why it could be up to a specified point of time it could be at a specified point of time or it could be at particular specified points of time maybe end of first quarter end of second quarter end of third quarter end of fourth quarter or it could be at the end of the year or it could be any time during the year we could have all three types of uh, uh, twists and uh, you know, nuances in the contract. This is this clear? But it'll obviously have to be for any contract it has to be one of these three. But it could be either type. Okay. So is this clear? And we'll break this up also. Add up to specified times. Buyer pays the premium. Okay. So you have basically you have right. You have buyer. It's a contract. It's a fin market contract. All right. Then you have um, seller. Buyer has right, and seller has liability or obligation. Okay. And you have uh, times. Okay. Specified. Uh, 
uh, we won't write specified we'll just write time so is this clear okay and what else is missing sell or buy underlying asset at predetermined price guide right. what is that price called strike. strike price okay good very good so that's the part that Kanika has added which I was going to add at uh, so this goes there at a specified at a specified price okay so this specified price is called the strike price okay so all this stuff this stuff some of this basic stuff you can find in your textbook also on options okay yeah so uh, so this is a good point so this this is all uh, also an important so now you understand the basics of options okay if so you have a financial market contract you have a buyer and the seller the buyer basically buys certain rights and when you buy certain rights you have to obviously pay for it okay so like in even in real estate markets you have options you have an option to buy a particular plot of land okay so those are also quite common in real estate so whenever you want to buy that option you have to pay some money okay so uh, therefore this is basically the structure of your option contract okay so the buyer has a right but not the obligation to sell by underlying you have an underlying asset that's important underlying asset is important okay and uh, so you understand now most of this stuff okay all right so let's look at something else which is okay so we look at uh, okay so now let's look at what do we need to so let's look at this part what happened who is looking at the time garvit is not here where is garvit garvit disappeared yes sir. he never came back <laughs> So I never saw him in the new classroom because I saw who entered. So now we have to cancel his attendance. No, you can't disappear like that in the class. How can you be in the washroom for the whole duration of the class? Who else is missing? No, one minute. Now who has, uh, okay, we have already deprived you of your camera. Kushbu, can you just take some pictures? I don't have a camera. You have, you have a Huh? Take attendance again. Okay, fine. Let's do it. Okay, we'll have to wait for a while now. We have covered very little material actually. So, what you should study now, what you should study is I'll, I'll give you some material to study. You read your basic textbook and try to figure out what are this this particular point. You try to figure out this particular point. The next point we are going to cover aspects of an option contract. Okay, so these are our, this is our 16.9. Okay. The first point I'm I'm making it easier for you guys to study. Every point is covered with an asterisk. The day is two asterisks. We have defined uh, derivative markets. We have defined options. Try to do some reading for your from your textbook. Okay, you can read. Uh, also, there's a very good book on options, guys, in your finance reference. You can read that risk management solutions booklet. For I think that's a low priority because that gives you an overview of that covers lots of exotic products which you don't need to know about. There's a very good book in that finance reference folder called um, Option Volatility and Pricing Strategies, Sheldon Nattenberg. Very good book if you're interested to learn about option. This is there in your finance reference, in your finance reference folder. Okay, uh, the Nattenberg book on option trading. You can read about options from there. Okay, he has some good discussions on statistics also. This is going to be our next point to be covered aspects of an option contract. Okay, then we have covered options. Okay, so because Garvid <laughs> is always <laughs> restless, so whenever the class is coming to an end, I always turn to Garvid to see if he's restless. That means the class is we are near the end of the uh, period. Where is this? Okay. So, are you following what we have discussed so far in the class? Because we had a very interrupt, we have a lot of interruptions today. The class was not satisfactory. But did you learn something? Yes, sir. Yes, Chuk. You learned something? Yes, sir. <laughs> Chuk, Chuk, is, Chuk should try to become a poker player because you have, you have like what is called a poker face. From your face, we can't make out whether your hand is good or bad. The, so this is called a poker face, but you can't make out.
but don't know what this guy did. Huh? You saw what the Microsoft Vice President uh, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs VP, he ran up some online poker debts. Then he stole money from here and there. Okay, I think we can close this.